uh, we are starting our uh, webinar. My name is Andrew Skubilius. I'm a member of the European Parliament from uh, Lithuania, from former Prime Minister, and also I am uh, co-chair of uh, uh, Euro, uh, of Euronest Parliamentary Assembly Delegation from European Parliament. And you know that Euronest is uh, a parliamentary assembly which is taking care about all the Eastern Partnership. Today we we are having a joint event organized by our informal EU Neighborhood East Forum with uh, SEPS. SEPS is uh, very very well known uh, think tank uh, here in Brussels, and I am very very happy that we shall uh, try to lead this uh, seminar together with Michael Emerson from SEPS. Uh, uh, as you know, and as you see from from the title of uh, of the seminar, uh, really uh, uh, title is is very very clear. Uh, Balkan and East European comparisons and and building a new momentum for the European integration experience of Balkan and Eastern European Associated States. And I think that really uh, what uh, we shall try to discuss is really a very important issue. Uh, important issue because uh, SEPs uh, uh, prepared very, very important and very valuable report, which, uh, uh, which uh, you, you can uh, uh, read, you can, you can look into it. And, and the report was, was prepared uh, uh, because uh, what SEPS started to do back in 2018, trying to compare Eastern Partnership countries with uh, Western Balkans, uh, for me, for, for, uh, for those who are looking from European Parliament towards Eastern Partnership countries, it looked like a very important job. So uh, now, really, um, we have uh, a special report and uh, it, it, it both answers a lot of questions which we were discussing earlier and also puts a lot of new ideas about how things uh, can develop with uh, EU neighborhood, including uh, Eastern Partnership countries, but also Western Balkan countries. I will try very briefly to say what, what is important from my point of view in, in that report. Then I will give the floor to Michael Emerson. Then we shall start all the discussion. It's possible to put uh, questions, you know, on on Q and A uh, or chat. But uh, since we have quite many uh, speakers, I'm not so uh, convinced that we shall have enough of time for uh, really uh, broader discussion after all the speakers will speak. But uh, uh, I will try to uh, to stress several moments. Really, when uh, you know, when uh, we we are looking into Eastern Partnership countries, especially into so-called three or most advanced who have association agreements, for me always it was uh, in some way not very clear why you know uh, we have uh, in some way different approach from EU side towards Eastern Partnership countries, those three or countries and Western Balkans. And we know what is the difference. You know, Western Balkans have uh, membership perspective uh, for three of countries that is not available. Uh, those countries are, are, are trying all the time to get some kind of more clear message from EU side. Uh, the message is not coming. Again, there are different reasons why. Uh, but that makes uh, mm, uh, that that always made me, you know, worrying uh, to worry about. Uh, how to keep motivation for reforms inside of those uh, three or countries if they are not getting some kind of much more clear perspective, you know, where they can hit and what's, what's at the end of the road. So that was why always we were raising that question. What is the difference in between of uh, Western Balkan countries and Eastern Partnership countries? And the report really with very precise data, very precise numbers brings very clear answer that uh, you know despite uh, differences uh, you know from eu side different approaches to those two regions those two regions are very similar in their development in in uh, in their development uh, on the path of integration in their development of making reforms and uh, if you will look into uh, into into the concluding data you will see that uh, uh, really um, uh, 
those three countries of Eastern Partnership region, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, are very, very, very similar in their, in their you know, uh, numbers with uh, leading Western Balkan countries. Georgia is uh, among, among the leaders of uh, all, 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 all the countries of Western Balkans and Eastern Partnership countries. Ukraine and Moldova are a little bit behind, but not, not, not very far away. And that's really, uh, that is a good message, first of all, for uh, those you know, trio, trio associated countries. That really, they, they were doing a good job. They were catching up with the association ag uh, agreements, with the free trade agreements, which really were very ambitious ones. And, and, and the outcome is here. Uh, for Western Balkans, it's also perhaps an important message that you know, they need to wake up in some cases, you know, there are those front runners in, in Western Balkans like uh, Montenegro or, 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 or North Macedonia and Serbia. But that is what, what Michael perhaps will explain much better. I am not feeling myself big expert on, on Western Balkans. Uh, but that is, that is a message that, you know, those from Eastern Partnership region are catching up. Are catching up in, and that's, that, that brings uh, then several more, uh, I would say, more geopolitical questions. Uh, if uh, if uh, Eastern Partnership uh, three or countries are so close to Western Balkan countries, the answer is a question why, you know, from EU side, we should uh, try to keep different policy approaches to those two, two, uh, two different regions. Second, of course, despite the fact that Western Balkans have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, membership perspective and, and Eastern Partnership trio do not have, but what, uh, what, uh, what this report is saying that, you know, um, uh, it's not very clear if Western Balkans really will get uh, up to full membership, uh, if EU will, uh, e will not be able uh, to make reforms of decision-making, you know, and institutions which uh, is an, an obstacle for further enlargement. So, and what's really important, the report proposes clear path to some kind of uh, intermediate status, which I, saw, I think that for Eastern Partnership countries really can be an, uh, a new, new path, new uh, doors, you know, uh, which, which could create for them very clear practical perspective. Uh, and that uh, intermediate status before full membership it can bring uh, almost, you know, majority of the benefits of full membership, like presence in a uh, single market, like, you know, access to EU funds uh, and to supervision of uh, a key community. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, only partial or progressive participation in EU institutions. Uh, I, at least myself, I call this, you know, uh, intermediate status as anti-chamber uh, membership, uh, you know, uh, uh, which can be described in a very clear way, which can be really attractive, you know, uh, uh, going forward and having very clear understanding how to reach that intermediate status. And that is, you know, something what Romana Prodi was speaking back, you know, I don't know even how many years ago. You know, at the beginning of 20s, when he was speaking about everything but institutions uh, as, as a possibility for, for enlargement, that is very similar to what uh, in the last year European Parliament report on Eastern Partnership Future was speaking about integration towards single market. And that is what I saw, uh, what Elmar Brock, famous, you know, former AFET uh, Chairman uh, is speaking even now in, in his recent article in uh, uh, Frankfurt and Allgemeine Zeitung. So that is that is I conclude here that really uh, I I would I would like to thank you know Seps for really very very inspiring intellectual discussion you know and some kind of geopolitical thinking back to to uh, Eastern Partnership uh, discussion and that is what I I. I think that it will be discussed very, 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 very deeply in, in forthcoming uh, Euronest uh, plenary sessions in different groups, in different, you know, uh, different seminars. And I hope that it will have an impact also on EU thinking before, EU institution thinking before Eastern Partnership Summit, which will be held uh, 
late uh, this year. So thanks a lot again to SEPS. And now I am very happy to introduce Michael Emerson, who uh, was leading all, all the preparation of this report and who we know for, you know, for his uh, permanent uh, inspiring intellectual job. And his article from 2018 was an inspiration for us to, to exactly to, to look for possibility to have this much, much broader report. So Michael, floor is yours. Michael, unmute yourself. Michael, unmute yourself. Right, is that okay. better now? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm very happy, Andreas, to accept your invitation um, together with uh, the co-authors um, of this quite long paper, who I see uh, most of them here present, uh, Veronica Mopchan, uh, um, Dennis Senusa, uh, Stephen Blockmans, um, and uh, Giannodia is not a, an author of the paper, but he's a frequent contributor uh, to our activities. Um, so um, I, I turn now to uh, make a, a succinct presentation of our paper. The key words are a new momentum needed for restructuring both enlargement and neighborhood policies, because both of these policies are not entirely satisfactory. I put it like that uh, diplomatically. The perceived incentives to drive the reform process, economic and political, uh, are not strong enough, either in the Balkans or in the Eastern European countries. Okay, the paper has two basic parts, two very different parts. One is um, uh, fairly technical uh, with quantified and uh, um, commented on ratings for all of the chapters um, of the uh, enlargement process and the chapters of the association agreements and DCFTAs, which are largely the same. That's technical stuff. I come to that in a moment. And the second part is about uh, policy and systemic ideas um, that might uh, be contributing to a new momentum. Right, on the ratings business, um, with, with you see there's masses of statistical detail and many sources in the paper. <clears throat> but the key starting point are <clears throat> the Commission's annual reports uh, on the Balkan states. Katerina Matarovna, I see you're there. And you and your colleagues have been doing a lot of very serious professional work there. And in particular, uh, in your very detailed annual reports for each chapter, <clears throat> you give coded summary language. Your codes are good progress, moderate progress, or some progress in terms of uh, alignment on EU standards. <clears throat> um, so we do two things with, with that material. First, it is quite easy <coughs> um, to translate these qualitative ratings into numerical ratings, which we do on the scale of three to one or zero. Um, and this has uh, the great advantages that they can be aggregated and averaged and used uh, as clearer benchmarks. <coughs> um, now, the second thing we do with uh, this is that we apply exactly the same methodology uh, with quantified uh, ratings for Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. <clears throat> um, and so we have a perfectly comparable, more or less perfectly comparable set of data, which you'll see lined up in table 17 on pages 49 to 51 of our paper. Um, <clears throat> Now, all of that sounds rather technical for the moment, but the real political point here before passing on to the political stuff is <clears throat> um, that this provides uh, potentially uh, the basis for uh, more clearly benchmarked monitoring and conditionality. 
Now, on the substance of the results, I'll say little because my uh, three colleagues from the three countries can come in more on this. But broadly, the story is that the two groups are roughly comparable in the aggregate, with the Balkans on average a bit ahead on political legal uh, criteria, whereas the East Europeans have advanced uh, much more on trade and economic cooperation uh, matters. Uh, I should say the data is up to date with the particular reference to Georgia, <coughs> because we have been very careful not to um, ignore recent developments, which in terms of political governance have been uh, pretty bad in Georgia. However, uh, this could even be corrected within the next two weeks as a result of uh, Charles Michel's uh, mission um, to Georgia last week. <coughs> so you could have a turnaround there. Uh, Giordania, no doubt, will update us on that. Right, now into the policy stuff. Um, uh, first point is that the Commission has been increasingly, not completely, but increasingly addressing the same policy instruments uh, beyond the association agreements to both groups. Uh, the Energy Community Treaty is the oldest and well, most well-known example. Uh, recent COVID-19 assistance is another one, and there are many other um, details there. <coughs> so the point here is that there is a very welcome, in our view, convergence of the policy sets being addressed to the two groups, which is a basis upon which to build more substantial recommendations, to which I now turn. <coughs> so this is all about the new, what could be the new desired momentum. Uh, well, the first point come, comes back then to um, the, these ratings. One could have, I mean, the Commission could proceed uh, next year um, to uh, adapt their annual ratings to the Balkans by adopting the quantification methodology that we have proposed and apply that equally to the Eastern Balkan states. So <coughs> there we would have, they would have established the basis for <coughs> conditionality, more, more, more operational conditionality um, giving um, meaning to the so far empty or vacuous or vague more for more statements, uh, welcome statements, but empty in practice. Now, next point is there is already underway um, tendencies towards deeper sectoral integration, um, um, particularly uh, in the case of Ukraine, which has led the uh, campaign to accede to sectoral unions, energy, digital customs, and so forth. And the Green Deal is the latest addition to this list. So this is an ongoing process, uh, which is fine. And uh, uh, we would advocate that it be uh, developed even more strongly. And the conditionalities in question there are the, are the sector's own uh, key. So that is clear. Um, we can go further and in terms of financial assistance, we can have the concept of progressive accession to the structural funds that would uh, indeed be um, delivering on the more for more condition, uh, slogan. Uh, but every step towards fuller uh, financial assistance would be linked to quantified uh, ratings of the kinds that we have developed in the paper. So, so far so good. All of this means that uh, in the realm of economic and regulatory policies, there is uh, an integration process is underway that can go faster, can be more strongly integrated between the two regions. Uh, but uh, our recommendations are building on what is of the present momentum. But this leaves out, and now I come to the final chapter, as it were, to the issue of progressive participation in the EU's governing institutions. 
Uh, no taxation without representation uh, got the American Civil War of Independence underway. <clears throat> no approximation without representation could be a useful phrase in political debates um, um, uh, with the partner states. Um, this is all about giving better political legitimacy to this heavy process of approximation of EU laws. That legitimacy uh, uh, is absent or largely absent today. So how to, how to overcome that? Well, in principle, it means looking at each of the institutions of the EU and examining um, how far it might be possible with goodwill to have a system of progressive integration into uh, participation in the institutions. Now, the biggest sticking point, the most from the EU point of view, the most understandable one concerns <coughs> uh, the number of seats around the council uh, table with every member state there retaining veto rights over some areas still of EU policy. Uh, the, if I may be simple and brutal, the Polish-Hungarian um, experiences uh, almost vetoing the COVID recovery plan, um, this has left a deep mark uh, which will not quickly be dissipated. But this does not mean that nothing can be done with the Council. And in particular, uh, the European Economic Area has a dialogue process with the sectoral councils and the joint letter of the three associated states of Eastern Europe, uh, which is publicly available, um, um, the joint letter of the 1st of February of this year, uh, advocates something similar um, for the partner states. Okay, now I go on to the European Parliament. And it's a bit cheeky for me to speak very freely about this, but anyway, uh, I'm an independent person. And in my view, in our view, um, participation, progressive participation of the partner states in the workings of the European Parliament are much easier to contemplate than for the Council, because uh, it's not a problem of numbers, because you're already at 700, so a few more doesn't make that much difference. In any case, you're voting on a, a simple majority basis in general. And so these factors make it possible to conceive in due course to have dependent upon political criteria conditionality, progressive uh, participation in the parliament with your elected members, so many, how many, uh, with or without first of all, but then later with voting rights, you could have um, a chain of progressive developments that are easy, is easy to envisage if you'll excuse me saying that, <laughs> this is easy. Obviously, very complex political question, but basically, conceptually, it's more straightforward than for the European Commission, where the issue is how to reduce the number of commissioners rather than uh, increase them. But here, one can put down a marker and say, this long-standing issue of the Commission might be resolved one day by having a constituency system uh, for a single um, commissioner representing several member states, like on the IMF uh, board. But in the meantime, you could have eligibility uh, for staff employment in the commission. Um, the EU's consultative institutions, Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions, no problem. You go ahead relatively easily there. Agencies of the EU, well, this is already happening. Um, and so can be pursued. And so overall, we have here, uh, to use a, a relatively new piece of Euro speak, uh, we're having um, a further development of the model of differentiated integration, um, which you can term, you can use if you like it. If you don't like it, you can leave it out. Uh, but this um, is recalling that within the existing structures of the EU, not all member states are in all EU policies. 
and some non-member states are in EU policies, Schengen, Euro, uh, and, and, and so forth. So there we are. Um, so the new momentum being advocated is that it should, for the future, uh, envisage progressively both functional and institutional integration uh, with carefully designed conditionality structures that can be built on a quantification of the ratings that we've illustrated um, in our paper. As regards the question of membership perspectives, uh, this old uh, tired expression, uh, we are advocating that the EU get away from in or out uh, um, concepts and think in terms and act in terms of progressive step-by-step -step, uh, integration. Um, these are issues that can reasonably go into the forthcoming um, conference on the future of Europe, um, uh, but it will take quite some time probably. Uh, but in any case, uh, the kind of measures uh, advocated here uh, can uh, progress on the basis of existing competences of the EU in the cases of uh, economic and regulatory policies, or may be open for provisional steps uh, or informal institutional arrangements that don't require uh, treaty revision. Thank you. Oh, Thanks a lot, now, Michael. Our chairman has disappeared. No, no, I'm he still is here. Now, no, no, he's sorry, no, 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 coming no, no, back. No, 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 I am um, here. I am here. Oh, there, am you, here. there you are. Sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah, still, still, I am, uh, yeah, still, uh, Parliament uh, Conference of Presidents is working very, very, very slow and, and late, so I, I am able to, <laughs> to chair the meeting for time being. But if I will switch off, so Michael will, will continue. So now, really, Michael, thanks a lot for your very, very, very good presentation, very, very, very deep and, and detailed presentation of the, of, the, of the report. Now we have experts who were working together with Michael uh, you know, on, on this report. And the first one will be Ms. Veronica Movchan, who represents also Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting, uh, Kiev. Colleagues, dear friends and colleagues, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure and honor to be today and speak on behalf of the uh, our Ukrainian team and actually on behalf of our old team for the uh, discussions related to Ukraine because we had a very, very intense and acute uh, debate how to ensure that the comparison that we did is really um, accurate, up to date and methodologically sound. I think that the topic that we are discussing to the new momentum for European integration for the Balkans and Eastern European Associated States is very important for my country and I believe also for the European Union and its neighborhood in general. Uh, as Michael already said, the creation of new, new momentum is uh, open the way for deeper integration and I think that we also stated that in the paper full membership it has been something that Ukraine has aspired for many years. Definitely the association agreement has been the great stage in achieving this goal and the most recent events, I mean EU-Ukraine Association Council that just happened last month and the ongoing visit of the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, to Kiev that is happening now, highlight the deepness and uh, comprehensiveness of links that our countries, our states developed up to now, and actually also the aspirations to deepen these relations further. For example, we have a couple takeaways from the council that highlight this statement. The parties announced uh, to move forward with a comprehensive review of the association agreement according to the article of the agreement and start consultation with the review of the uh, trade liberalization of the DCFTA. Also, there is a recognition and a active work on the approximation of policies and legislation of this EU Green Deal, the most ambitious, I think, the agenda that will define our policy and social debates for many years ahead. 
the same ambition is raised. I mean, the ambition for deeper cooperation is raised by the joint letter of foreign ministries of Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, that was recently sent to the EU. So basically the topic that we need, the associations agreements are great, the current, they increase and allow much deeper cooperation, but something needs to be done further. It's in the air and it's not only in the air, it's in the policy and it's a policy debate at the highest political level between our states. And uh, our analysis showed uh, that uh, our comparison showed that actually Ukraine moved forward a lot and I'm uh, very grateful for Mr. Kabilis for recognizing that uh, Ukraine and other states did a lot in the implementation of association agreements. Uh, basically, our we did assessments of 27 various parameters that uh, represent all key elements of the association agreement. And they showed uh, that for Ukraine, uh, trade and economic and sectoral cooperation are much more important, uh, not, not important, all important, but much more uh, effective, uh, while Ukraine is still lagging behind in the rule of law and anti-corruption efforts. First, I will say what was done for good, and then I will say where we have the still challenges and tasks for the future. Uh, I think that the, one of the major uh, achievements of the recent period of reforms and implementation of the association agreement, are, first of all, public procurement with the establishment of the absolutely new uh, transparent uh, system of uh, online public procurement preserve that was recognized by uh, not only by our partners in the EU, by EBRD, by the World Bank, it's, it become one of the example case of the public procurement. But more importantly, it allowed uh, ensuring that the money, uh, the budget money, uh, the uh, state budget money, they are used properly. This is one of the major challenges for the economists uh, like Ukraine to be sure that the budget is spent effectively and transparently. Other important challenges that and are important reforms are the product safety. There are now discussions of ACA, Agreement on Confirmity Assessment and Acceptance of Industrial Products. And uh, I'm really happy that the pre-assessment mission of the European Union is now working with Ukraine because Ukraine has did a first round of legal harmonization already in 2014. It appeared it was not complete, but uh, it took many years to, to work on systematically on what was done and what has to be done. I'm sure that this uh, comprehensive review of the mission will keep a, give a roadmap that allow Ukraine to finalize its efforts because Ukraine has already did a lot. It did not do it perfectly as the first uh, rumors about the conclusions of the mission show up, but they did a lot to penetrate into the European and other markets with these products and the completion of this process will, will uh, give not only economic benefits, but also some important like image benefits, prestige benefits for the country. Food safety is another important uh, sphere there. Ukraine is moving uh, steadily ahead. And I'm happy to uh, say that uh, last year we had the first recognition of equivalence, which is something similar to ARCA. So something that's saying that this system uh, of uh, safety in this sphere is working equivalently to the European sphere. It's in seats, which is which is important. And also we have a lot of progress in animal origin products in general in the food safety. Financial markets is another sphere that was uh, very much challenged for many years. And we have a lot of progress here. Probably the best indication that something changed is that over 2020, despite the economic crisis, we didn't have any crisis in the banking sector because all years before uh, banking sector was the year first to fill the crisis. 
and to respond to the crisis. Uh, by uh, a lot of non-performing loans, we still have them accumulated from the previous periods, not fully cleaned. But now the situation really changed and Ukraine is gradually implementing the quite rigorous European legislation. Energy sector, another very complex and very uh, difficult sector for Ukraine, where we have the reforms in the gas and electricity market that allowed uh, concluding absolutely new agreement with Russia on transit based on the uh, third uh, package of European norms and rules. So uh, creating also opportunity integrating Ukrainian system of transit and gas storages into the European system. Uh, there is some progress in energy saving and energy efficiency. There is a boost in renewable energy. The system is not developed perfectly, but uh, for sure Ukraine is developing here. I'm not saying that Ukraine did everything greatly perfectly and the path is straight and fast. There are a lot of hurdles, but the country is definitely moving forward. We have, and moving forward in any aspect, in customs, competition, consumer rights, many, many others. The, for me, the major challenges and drawbacks that Ukraine currently faces, and it's properly reflected in our assessment, is in uh, rule of law and anti-corruption. 2020 was a very difficult year for these spheres in Ukraine with a lot of uh, decisions, especially of the constitutional court, uh, uh, dragging back uh, achievements of anti-corruption infrastructure and institutions. So there was uh, decisions of the parliament to recount decisions of the court, but I would not say that this story is over. Uh, still, uh, I, I would say that it's very good news that the uh, president just announced the relaunch of the judiciary reform as uh, one of the priorities for these and coming years. So if we look at the scores, we see that Ukraine performed uh, quite good in trade and economic spheres. It also performed quite good in the uh, ballot box, electoral legislation, decentralization, political elements improved definitely. Here is still lagging behind in very fundamental issues of rule of law and and decorruption, but still, if we compare it with other countries, we see that uh, we are still on, on pair. Every country has its own fights and its own ups and downs, but despite all these ups and downs, the uh, uh, geopolitical ambiguity is gone, the direction is clear, and the path is uh, also absolutely clearly defined. So, uh, these uh, now these comparison comparison of Balkans and uh, three um, associated states uh, for me it allows uh, making much more like vocal request that uh, for you our regions should be treated equally should be treated in the day that we have similar opportunities uh, we have. Uh, similar aspirations and we, we should get a similar instruments how to re realize these aspirations. Therefore, for me, this study and the, the ideas presented there are very important. It's a uh, new way forward, better structured, uh, much more clear without these mixed signals and that would be very welcome. How would it, how, Ukrainian uh, stakeholders would react. We did not present that in Ukraine yet. This is the first presentation, so I can take only my assumptions. But what I would expect for Ukrainian citizens, the uh, clear cut path, this more differentiated but clearly defined stages and options for deeper integration would be definitely welcome because people are generally supporting deeper integration with the EU with of about half of population saying yes for sure for EU integration and actually uh, ambiguity of Russian integration decreased strongly but a lot of people say that they want something like third path. Uh, 
So the message for them that the EU is uh, offering some clear cut stages would be great. For business uh, association agreement, DCFTA, energy union, uh, and all other sectoral uh, cooperation and visa free also, it's, this is all welcomed opportunities that are actively used and the business is actually demanding more opportunities, more opening. For government integration, the use a strategic goal and uh, the uh, the clear road map with more detailed sectoral opportunities is what is Ukrainian government is actually calling for. And yet, uh, finally, also important, maybe last but not least, that Ukraine is fighting the, with the war with Russia. And it's not only conventional military trade wars, it's an informational fight. And the message that you does not you want Ukraine, does not need Ukraine, it's, it's manipulative, but it's actively used. Uh, for Ukraine, this uh, opportunity for staged by clear card uh, path to the membership for path to the deeper integration will be essential because I, I am really grateful for European Parliament that always suggests and highlights that Ukraine deserves a membership and it it will happen eventually. It's important, but long term statements they are in the modern world they are losing a bit of appeal. They are dusted by uh, short term shocks. So clear cut stages is something that would give much better and uh, uh, comprehensive signal to the society, to the business, to the partners. It offers steps, it offers flexibility, it gives the goal and uh, opportunities. So far, so I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity to participate in the creation of this idea and I hope it will be taken seriously in Brussels and in member states and will be actually implemented. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Veronica. Thanks a lot. Really, I see that uh, there are a lot of uh, things which, which we need to discuss and time is running very fast. So I will ask uh, next speakers to be maybe, you know, to try to, to keep somewhere out of seven minutes in our presentation. So the next uh, expert is Denis uh, Tsanusha uh, from expert group Kishinev. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kubilius. Um, I'm glad to be part of this effort uh, and exercise where we really try to uh, improve the chances for Eastern European countries, but mostly for the associated uh, states to actually have a better understanding of where we stand in the relationship with the European Union and how close we are to the uh, EU membership perspective. I'm glad that, um, that Veronica did a great job and she introduced many aspects, so I will try not to repeat uh, what she mentioned uh, in her presentation, um, but I will focus on, on Moldova and what we are, we, what we are observing uh, in, in this country right now. Um, we have used some other materials, uh, publications that we are producing together with uh, Michael Emerson and other experts from our countries, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, uh, so uh, the new Momentum publication is also based on other expertise that we have developed so far. And I'm thankful to, to the Swedish government for supporting uh, this initiative. Um, Moldova, unfortunately, is, uh, looks a little bit less, um, let's say, uh, well-performing country compared to Georgia and Ukraine. Um, in, the case of, in the case of macroeconomic uh, macroeconomic situation and the political one, Moldova is, uh, is uh, having uh, worse results than, uh, for instance, the trade cooperation and economic, uh, and economic field of uh, EU-Moldova relations. And that's uh, somehow reflected in the, uh, in the figures, because we know very well that Moldova is, uh, is one of the most uh, uh, integrated uh, in terms of trade um, country from the uh, from the association associated group, we have uh, around 65% of trade that goes to to the EU, and at the same time we have another linkage which is uh, which is emerging, and this is uh, uh, this is related to the remittances. Uh, Moldova is receiving from the EU countries about 45% of remittances that comes 
uh, from Moldovans, uh, from the diaspora and uh, Moldovan immigrants who are settled in the EU. And this gives uh, like a, a very clear uh, perspective about how important is the European Union to, to the Moldovans. And the same goes, the same, uh, the same kind of um, closeness that Moldovans feel towards the EU is also uh, indicative if we look at the polls, which are showing clearly that the European integration or the EU as a perspective for foreign orientation of the country is about 50% of the of the total um, support, and this is two times more than the Eurasian Union, which is which is fiercely promoted by some pro-Russian political parties in Moldova. So we have this trade aspects, which are which are very optimistic. Moldova is developing the trade with the EU, and the European market is, market is becoming more and more attractive for for the European for the Moldovan businesses. But um, on the other hand, we have the good governance and rule of law. Uh, which also touches upon the uh, the corruption where Moldova is not uh, is not performing well, and that's exactly where Moldova is uh, is delivering worse. And uh, we we will see in the new momentum publication that uh, Moldova is actually uh, lagging behind compared to to Ukrainian colleagues and and, and Georgian ones. Um, if we take in a, in a more uh, detailed um, uh, analysis uh, or look at the uh, progress that Moldova has made so far. Uh, obviously, um, Moldova is 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 trying to 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 delineate or to separate its its dialogue with the EU. This is my feeling, uh, because when the politics is is uh, is on the wrong path, then a huge attention is given to the uh, to the uh, dialogue on on trade, and there we saw. Uh, Good initiatives, including in the in the field of SPS, we have recently learned that Moldova is very close to finish the uh, evalu the um, preparation for the um, evaluation on being able to export the animal uh, origin food, uh, which in in this case, in the first attempt, is for the eggs. But then, hopefully, it will be for other products as well. This means that. Some work is done in terms of uh, in terms of conformity for the laboratories and and the standards, and um, at the same time uh, the TBT is uh, t the 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 uh, non tariff uh, non tariff barriers is also a place where Moldova is is showing uh, good progress because the most uh, uh, the, the the biggest um, number of uh, European standards uh, I think out of three countries is uh, is adopted in Moldova. And this is a good thing. Now we need to work on, on making them actually practical, useful for the for the business and creating preconditions for more business to work with European uh, with the European uh, partners. Um, if if to focus specifically on who is going to win uh, and who is going to benefit from what we recommended in our publication, obviously, uh, the uh, the main uh, winner will be the population because uh, the signal that the new the new momentum paper is giving is that rule of law, the fighting of corruption, uh, reform of judiciary are priorities, and the European Union should stay very strong on keeping the conditionality to have a progress in these areas. This also should uh, include for for Moldova. Um, the political, the improvement of the political dialogue between the uh, presidency office and the parliament in order to have as soon as possible early elections to, to create a new configuration in the legislative uh, branch and to give it an opportunity to create a more pro-reform government that would support the, uh, the agenda of the president, of the new president, Maya Sandu. And all of this is, uh, is a very, um, it's a very positive trend that, that I can see from what, from our recommendations to the European partners, but also for the for the European public. And uh, on the other hand, uh, obviously, as as Veronica mentioned, the business is waiting for uh, for the improvement of the political conditions and good governance. Uh, this also uh, should mean that the prosecutor office and other institutions that are working in the field of anti-corruption should really uh, make sure that the rent-seeking practices are stopped. That the uh, that the abuses of the office uh, does is not is not a common feature 
uh, for the uh, relationship between the business uh, and, and the state authorities. And in general, that the sense of fighting corruption is becoming uh, a prominent uh, effort for the entire political class, because this is a problem. Moldova is a corrupt country. Everybody understands that, but the actions uh, to be uh, to fight this, uh, uh, in a way, this um, a negative uh, aspect is not as visible in the political uh, in the political arena, uh, apart from some political parties with pro-EU views. Um, so overall, I would like to uh, to support uh, the um, initiative of the European Parliament to promote the the uh, opportunity to actually bring the two regions uh, together and to show that Eastern Partnership countries are in some regards are even better performers than, than the, the Western Balkan uh, states, which means that we can deliver reforms, which means that M Moldova as Ukraine and Georgia should have a very clear um, roadmap to the EU <clears throat> membership perspective. And here I will end my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Denise. And now we're turning to Georgia. Uh, Gia Nodia from Ilya State University. Belize, please. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I will try to stick to my uh, talking notes and uh, hopefully will be on, on the 10 minutes. Now, first, I will start by very highly praising the new momentum initiative and the wording of it. There is a strong feeling that after association agreements, the CFDAs and visa-free regimes for the three countries, there have been no obvious achievements or there is nothing like a distinct and understandable roadmap, as, as Leon has just said, in the relations between the EU and its neighborhood. And this absence is damaging for us. But I would also dare to say that this initiative of qualitatively enhancing the role of Europe in our region is something that Europe needs as well. Uh, this, our three countries, is a place where the magic of the European idea still works more than elsewhere. To be sure, this is a very difficult region, difficult for obvious geopolitical reasons, as well as for problems and divisions within each country. But this is the region where Europe can make a lot of difference. And this difference will be welcomed by majorities in local societies. So this is also a chance for the EU to show that it can be important, successful, and popular. We in Georgia are in the middle of another political crisis, so I cannot do otherwise but focus on it. This crisis escalated after the police stormed the headquarters of the, of the, of the United National Movement, Georgia's strongest opposition party, to arrest its leader, Nick Amelia. But it started after uh, the opposition refused to accept the results of October 2020 parliamentary elections as fraudulent and decided to boycott parliament. The government and the opposition have diametrically opposed views on both these issues. The government claims that there was nothing wrong about elections and it had strong legal grounds to arrest Melia. The opposition says that it was deprived of an electoral victory and that Melia's arrest was politically motivated and part of the government's plan to destroy the opposition. Whatever we think of these arguments, the crisis is threatening the future of the Georgian democracy. It is also obviously linked to the topic of our seminar, which is the issue of Europe in Georgia, in my country's case, or Georgia in Europe. There is a broad understanding that <clears throat> the stakes in this crisis are very high. This is not about who will or will not be in Georgia's government. No, the question is, will Georgia make a turn towards authoritarianism? Will its political system make a step in the direction of Russia and Belarus? Or it continues to be an aspiring democracy, even if a deeply imperfect one. This also makes the outcome of the crisis very important for the future relations between Georgia and Europe. This is not my personal view only, although I strongly concur with it. This assessment is widely shared by pro-democracy society in Georgia, but also by friends of Georgian democracy in Europe, as well as in the United States. But <clears throat> at this point, Europe is much more active. It was 
clearly stated by many European politicians, including Charles Michel, the chairman of the European Council, who visited Georgia this Monday with an explicit aim of helping resolve this crisis. Michel said that the EU should move from facilitation to mediation in trying to resolve relations between the Georgian government and the opposition. We interpret this as saying that the EU has to have a much more direct and much higher level involvement in the res resolution of the crisis. After a meeting involving the government and opposition representatives and Michel, uh, the Georgian political elite and government got a specific assignment, as it were, to come up with a feasible plan to resolve the crisis within two weeks, when Georgian Prime Minister Irakli Garibashvili is expected in Brussels. The failure to show some achievement will affect Georgia's future relations with Europe. It was not spelled out what exactly these negative consequences will be, but even the word sanctions is occasionally mentioned by some European politicians. At this point, we don't know what the outcome of the talks between government opposition will be. Three days out of 14 have already passed. We cannot say there is an, any progress on any of the issues. However, if there is a reality, realistic hope of resolving this crisis in a way that does not imply Georgia's turn towards authoritarianism, this hope is linked to Europe's close involvement that is now expressed in the term of mediation. So if our panel happened one week ago, uh, I would have been in a much gloomier mood than I am today. Now there is some hope at least. And uh, it is due to this high level European mediation. These hopes were revived thanks to some changes uh, that we had as a direct result of the Michel visit. First of all, the government drastically changed its rhetoric. Before this meeting, Garibashvili, Prime Minister Garibashvili ruled out any dialogue with the opposition that it frequently defined as a criminal force. He was known for his statements that the government's aim is not just to defeat the opposition, the elections, it is to destroy it. Now he is engaged in dialogue and his rhetoric after the Michel facilitated meeting was uh, was that uh, he spoke about the opposition in respectful terms and expressed willingness to further dialogue. If before the government did not recognize that anything deserving a wording of crisis was taking place, now it appears to accept that some special efforts were indeed needed. The opposition was also criticized for its intransigence. The decision not to accept the results of parliamentary elections was met by nearly unanimous criticism from the international community. Frankly, I also criticized this decision. However, to understand, uh, I'm sorry, while uh, this was criticized because violations were obvious and pervasive, but the opposition did not have a conclusive evidence that they changed the overall results of the elections. However, it has to be noted that all eight opposition parties were unified in that stand of boycott. Only one small party later changed its mind. These parties disagree on many things, but they are still adamant that their decision was correct. Whether we like it or not, their position reflects a new mood of the part of the large part of the Georgian electorate that the process of state capture by a billionaire, Vidina Ivanishvili, who is still widely believed to be behind the Georgian dream government, has gone too far. And this state capture would not allow for a normal electoral change of government. While the West asks the opposition to work through the institutions, the opposition response is that uh, the, the institutions, including the courts as well as electoral administration, are captured by Vanishvili and his team, so they cannot work through that. 
one may agree or disagree with uh, uh, with this assessment of the situation but this mood within large part of the pro democracy and pro euro public in georgia is genuine and the opposition thinks it would lose credibility if it does not respond to it this makes resolving the conflict difficult as positions of the parties are widely apart the opposition demands new elections and release of what it calls the political prisoners one possibility of a compromise is plebiscite on the necessity of new elections but just elections just calling elections is not sufficient there should be changes in electoral legislation and electoral administration as well so far the government has showed some readiness to make concessions uh, as concerns electoral legislation but on the next day after the meeting with michel premier garibashvili said that the issues of early elections and political prisoners are a red line for the government and it will not accept compromise on them critics believe that this was a reversal of his position on the previous day when he agreed with a six point framework uh, for the negotiations with the opposition uh, uh, drafted during the michel mediated meeting which included the issues of alleged political prisoners and potential new elections this does not mean that some middle ground cannot be found in this uh, uh, 11 days left but it will not be easy as michel has mentioned while georgia may be ahead as michael sorry well has mentioned while georgia may be ahead of other cfda countries with regards to anti corruption or some other indicators of good governance trade etc it's lagging behind on electoral democracy and this crisis demonstrated this i would say that there are two major issues uh, that the pro democracy and pro european georgian society greece are crucial for the future of the georgian democracy electoral democracy and the system of justice Uh, but both these issues are on the table in uh, this eu mediated negotiations and they are on the table both with regards to resolving pending issues hot issues like alleged political prisoners like melia and georgi rurua or early elections but there is also an issue of systemic institutional changes uh, that would uh, produce trust to public trust to both the system Evidently also these two issues are interrelated it is hardly possible to have fair and credible elections if the courts are captured or are believed to be captured by the incumbent government this cannot be solved easily and overnight uh, there is a perception in georgia that we are deadlocked especially as a just as far as the justice system is concerned Uh, but uh, resolving the ongoing crisis or the way in, in which the ongoing crisis will be resolved will also show how we will be able to tackle these deeper systemic problems thank you um i think uh, uh, andris kubilis he is temporarily absent so <coughs> um i take over <coughs> for a few minutes um Thank you very much Jeff for that very very <coughs> fascinating up to date account and uh, we all follow what is happening with the greatest of interest and you've um, given us the framework for that just before passing on to the next uh, three panelists all diplomats from the missions to the EU I noticed one <coughs> chat question came through which was from uh, Tiona Lavrendashvili who sounds a little bit Georgian um who asks whether uh, we should add <coughs> to our institutional arguments in our paper um to the idea that the partner states ought themselves to be invited to participate both governmental level and societal level <coughs> in the conference for the future of Europe i believe the balkans are cooking up some kind of uh, request along these lines um and then for the eastern partnership uh, three 
uh, associates. Uh, I think this is a very pertinent suggestion, which we could have included in our paper. Thank you for that. So let us move on to the next uh, session. <coughs> uh, first, we have Irina Yefremova, who is deputy head of the mission of Ukraine uh, to the European Union. Irina, over to you. <coughs> Are you there, Irina? Yes, thank you very much. Are you? And uh, yes. my. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I believe that uh, we have uh, our um, well message from my ambassador, ambassador of U Ukraine, Ambassador Tochitsky. Uh, is it? Yes. Yeah, maps, Andres Kubilis, my oh. colleague, the ambassador. We are grateful to Andres Kubilis for launching and supporting this initiative and steps for this in-depth study. This is a very timely and important event against the background of a significant intensification of the TRIO initiative. TRIO countries have come to a critical point where their achievements do not coincide with the ambitions that the European Union allows. This study also proves that our ambitions for deeper political association and economic integration have meaningful basis. That analysis allowed us to see that the countries of the Western Balkans region have almost similar achievements. And I fully agree with Andreas Kubilis that in the first five years of the association, the trio has been able to overtake the countries of the Western Balkans, which had an EU membership perspective 10 years ago. We appreciate considering in the study the new momentum for closer association and integration with EU. Trio countries continue to fight for their European choice in confrontation and war with Russia. Recently visiting Ukraine, the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, also stopped in Donbass and saw the consequences of Russia's aggressive policy, which would destroy entire region. Dear colleagues, our aspirations for full-fledged membership in the EU are dedicated by real demands of the time. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, that's, uh, that was the message from Ambassador Tachitsky, who is currently in, in Ukraine. Uh, he was accompanying uh, the president of European um, uh, Council for, for the visit uh, to Ukraine. And um, it was a very successful visit. And we appreciate very much for all support given to the Mr. Charles Michel during the visit. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Irina. Um, yes, and now uh, let's go to uh, Moldova, Daniela. Morari, Ambassador of Moldova to the European Union. Um, over to you, Daniela. Thank you very much, Michael. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to, to join the other speakers and thanking um, Mr. Kubilius and his team of putting it together, this initiative. And also thank you to you, Michael, and to Denise and to colleagues from SEPS to doing all this work and all the effort. Uh, and indeed, it's kind of uh, building on the very valuable handbooks that worked for all three countries on the association agreements. I'm going into details. And uh, know how complicated our association agreed, uh, agreements are. And it's very also valuable to have more people on board and knowing all the tiny details. And also uh, building the previous study that you already worked uh, on three of us. 
And indeed, I agree that it's a timing of having these discussions. And indeed, it's a, it's a momentum, I would say. The timing, it comes through a few um, reasons. Uh, first, it's also a good timing for preparing uh, the future deliverables for post-2020 within the Eastern Partnership. Uh, after a long uh, brainstorming phase that we had last year, and also like uh, after the implementation and also looking on these 20 deliverables uh, for 2020, now it's indeed uh, the work uh, to see uh, a very concrete and ambitious and visionary objectives for all of us to work for the future. And also it comes uh, really in time and in line with our joint letter uh, that our ministers of foreign affairs signed on 1st of February, uh, where we are asking member states and the institutions to engage in identifying new areas and new forms for deeper cooperation with all three countries that we have association agreements. We believe that indeed more substance and more vision uh, for post-2020 deliverables is needed, and this will facilitate also the negotiations for the future joint declaration that we all know that sometimes is a challenging exercise for all of us. And we believe that more substance also can be put in enhanced cooperation in all the kind of sectors that some of you referred, like transport and energy and digital transformation and Green Deal, and justice, home affairs, strategic communication, and healthcare, uh, and also enhancing security and defense uh, cooperation with special focus on hybrid threats is also of particular interest for us, and deepening um, uh, cooperation uh, going beyond the DCFT, it's uh, one of the areas where we're very interested. This study has a particular double relevance and symbolism for Moldova, Take into consideration that Moldova is the only country that we're from the Eastern Partnership part in all the structures of the Western Balkans. RCC, CCP, Central um, European Initiative, even next year we're going to be presidents of CEFTA. And uh, we're taking part in all the decision-making processes. We're agreeing priorities for the future and also implementing similar homework, but without the tools and instruments that are available for the Western Balkans. Um, we welcome the, the work that was done in order to compare. We believe that it's so necessary to have this kind of valid uh, arguments and um, kind of to do the work of comparison. Uh, and um, also the, the methodology that was used to, to, to base on already general accepted reports and data and uh, different references. And uh, indeed, this work makes to recognize uh, several truths. One is that indeed we managed to deliver and register progress, like three of uh, countries that we have association agreements, uh, in very short time, just like since we started implementation of our association agreements. And without, as uh, my other colleagues also preferred, without having the perspective and without having access to the financial instrument that the Western Balkans have. And also to recognize and to highlight and to put more emphasis of the need to further continue to share different platforms and instruments that were offered to Western Balkans, to countries as, uh, uh, as kind of Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Um, we um, are already being part in all these structures would have even more examples where this uh, cooperation kind of is beneficial and where we already interconnect or interlinked in different platforms or different initiatives where different countries from 3AA apart and then a, a differentiation uh, with, within the West Balkans, we can share afterwards with the authors that uh, that kind of work to understand maybe can be valuable. And also we believe that this is not only for us valuable, but we believe it can be very useful also for Western Balkans, uh, because uh, some of the work that we're doing in the Eastern Partnership, uh, we see that also it can be in a way beneficial for the work and the platforms and the summits and the different in a way 
practical elements can be known on both uh, kind of way. Um, we, um, I personally read with high interest the, the, the study and uh, we resonate with the visionary approach uh, that is kind of in the ideas for the new momentum. Maybe some uh, could consider that uh, some of the ideas are premature or too ambitious, but we agree that it's important maybe to start uh, a debate and to have a platform for discussions, a platform for brainstorm uh, where we could uh, also discuss ambitions and visionary ideas. Uh, we resonate and we agree that European Parliament is usually this platform where uh, uh, very ambitious and uh, visionary ideas can be in a way debated and uh, we would just in a way resonate with, with this and we will start to contribute and we believe that such a debate and such further discussions um, could uh, fit in in the future in a way a conference on the future of Europe like we will just welcome this in a way approach. Uh, being a very pragmatic in a way, um, I also would be interested how from some of the ideas that have been already mentioned within the study, uh, we can uh, also discuss and, uh, and they can, some of the ideas can be taken on board within the um, uh, like work on the future deliverables for the Eastern Partnership and also on the way for the summit of Eastern Partnership that should take place in the second part of this year. And um, also um, taking consideration that now it's a lot of work in shaping the ways uh, of the new programs of the European Union for the next seven years. Also, it would be important to see how uh, some additional access uh, can be offered for, for the countries with an Eastern partnership, or namely the three uh, countries that are implementing uh, association agreements. Um, just would like to, to double highlight the, the support and the commitment of the Republic of Moldova to, to join this work and um, to, to see how we further, in a way, could, could build and to extend uh, many of the good ideas that have been uh, highlighted in the study. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Andreas, I see you're back. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but just to make sure we don't miss something, it is now uh, Zurab uh, Kamzaridzi who, uh, who should speak. You're sure, absolutely. Thanks a lot, uh, Mikhail, for your Welcome great job. Back. I am. I am I am back. Andreas is back. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Not only Biden, but also I. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon to everybody. I am replacing Ambassador Natalia Savanadze, who is on board of a plane flying from Georgia to Brussels as we speak. Um, so I would like to join the previous panelists and thank the organizers for this webinar, and but also special thanks to the authors of this uh, study, which is very timely and necessary. It contains interesting ideas that can be picked up, developed, but also translated into concrete policy steps. Uh, the study points out that uh, with the association agreement and the DCFTAs, the most advanced integration <coughs> instruments, the association trio achieved a lot and has been able to catch up with the countries of the Western Balkans. Hence, the need on the EU side to, to catch up and adapt policy doctrines to the realities. The EU can also consider applying the same policy instruments towards both the Balkans and the associated countries, which, as the, part, as the study puts, would encourage the countries and possibly boost reform agenda in other partner countries too. We agree with the notion that at this current important juncture, for the Eastern Partnership, the EU must take next brave geopolitical steps, as also said in the foreword of the study. This brave step is needed, especially against the backdrop of the EU developing a new generation of deliverables and the ongoing work on the joint staff working document, which will define the EU strategy towards the Eastern Partnership for, year, for the years to come. The upcoming Eastern Partnership Summit gives us both the partners as well as the EU such an opportunity. It should address the ongoing political and security developments in the region, which is still plagued by conflict, occupation, and open military uh, confrontation. 
We also welcome the idea of the conference on, on the future of Europe to address the recommendations described in this study. For the future of this, the partnership is also Europe's uh, future and use active engagement with the associated trio is use investment in strengthening democracy, expecting the area of prosperity and security in the EU's eastern neighborhood. In this respect, this study is a timely contribution to the preparation for the EAP summit and can serve as a guide, including beyond 2021 summit. It can also encourage debate about how to find best solutions which would advance the principle of differentiation more for more, as well as ensure conditionality and inclusivity. These two sets of goals are compatible and by no means represent a challenge to the structure of the EAP, as every EAP partner is free to choose the level, speed, and the nature of the engagement with the EU. Uh, there are also areas which the study says requires better performance by the associated trio, and where improvements are expected. It also shows the varying degree of progress among the trio countries in their relations with the EU, as well as in the process of the implementation of the associated association agreements and the TCFTAs. Uh, besides, the study rightly points out to the preparedness, I would rather say the unpreparedness of the EU for further enlargement, which will, one, which will be one of the, if not the key factors associated trio should take into account while taking policy decisions at the national level with regard to the membership question. Just to briefly sum up, TRIO has been performing well, but improvements are still needed and expected. The EU needs to take brave, creative steps and offer TRIO a new set of goals that goes beyond uh, the uh, association agreement and the DCFTAs. Solid and converging similarities exist between the countries of the Western Balkans, including the candidate countries and the associated TRIO. And last but not least, geopolitical considerations cannot be ignored, especially given the developments in the region which require use response, for example, more active engagement in the areas such as security and defense, strengthening resilience, countering hybrid threats, disinformation, and other areas. I will uh, stop here and uh, pass back uh, to you, Ola. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Zurab. Thanks a lot. Really uh, appreciate very much your, 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 your statement. We wish all the best for Georgia to overcome uh, <laughs> the crisis, you know, and uh, still really in the report, uh, Georgia is featuring as, as real, real front runner. So let's, let's, let's hope that it will continue. You know. Now we are turning to uh, next uh, uh, stage of our discussion, very important one, uh, and uh, we shall have uh, views from from uh, institutions, EU institutions, and I will ask uh, Mrs. Katerina Maternova, whom we know very well, Deputy Director General at DG NIR, and also acting head of SGUA uh, for, for Ukraine, uh, to take the floor now. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and dear friends, uh, colleagues. Uh, thanks a lot, Michael, for for the presentation and and all the uh, and all the uh, participants in the in the discussion. Uh, I think it's uh, in fact uh, very welcome to have a more strategic discussion on uh, how to go about the future. We are obviously in the process of. Uh, uh, revising the or, or reviewing the policy for the next stage of the Eastern Partnership. Mm -hmm. The question and the, of the balance between inclusiveness and uh, and tailor making and also looking at the at the trio is is uh, on the agenda uh, more than ever right now, especially with the current situation in the in the partnership. And we hear, uh, I think, increasingly. Um, comments of, of this sort. Uh, last week we had this Goa meeting with member states and it was in fact Germany that brought the uh, issue on the table of, of, of seeing what can be or should be uh, done addressing the, the uh, uh, trio. Just let me point out, uh, yes, Moldova was the first one and I think Daniela made a good case of how Moldova is part of 
various uh, various uh, 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 institutions that uh, that covers the Western Balkans. But in fact, it's been the it's been Georgia and uh, Ukraine that have taken the unprecedented steps, the step to actually enshrining in the constitution the desire to join the uh, European uh, uh, the European Union. So I think that the the uh, comparison of how the EU approaches the Western Balkans and and uh, the Eastern Partnership, I think it's a it's a, it's an intellectually interesting and and uh, certainly a, a legitimate legitimate inquiry, uh, and and I'm sure that uh, a lot of the re parts of the um, uh, uh, study and and studies recommendations is something that uh, we will certainly be able to. To reflect on, uh, but we live in uh, we live in uh, the European reality as we do. Uh, we have uh, a foreign policy of the EU firmly in the hands of the of the member states, and as you know, views on views on not only Eastern Partnership but also the the, the, the European future of the Western Balkans are spanning quite a quite a wide uh, spectrum. This is not uh, to sound defensive. This is just uh, the reality that, uh, that we practice. But I think that within the constraints of, of, the, of the current setup, we actually have a lot that we can, we can do, we have been doing, and I think we can, we can uh, expedite uh, uh, going forward. And I'm just going to use a, a few uh, examples. Um, we have, in fact, uh, and this was done in a very different geopolitical context, we have, in fact, uh, indeed, and I think this is where I would agree with the study, we have loaded the, um, the association agreements and the DCFTAs with quite a lot of uh, uh, expectations, and I would say regulatory burden uh, on, the, uh, on the shoulders of our partners, in fact, going beyond what happens in the pre-accession phase, currently countries that are going through the accession. So indeed that, that was uh, done. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be the outcome if, if, the, if the policy was being designed now, but uh, the process we are going through uh, currently, we started with Ukraine and, and I think, uh, you know, this is the area where we can follow with a, with a trio is really taking full advantage uh, and not being as shy as we perhaps uh, might have been sometimes about what the association agreements and the DCFTAs offer. We are now uh, exploring uh, the, what, what it really means, the internal market treatment in, uh, in, in several uh, service areas. Uh, we are starting with the, we are starting uh, with the area of digital, uh, uh, digital, digital market, because this is something that's only evolving in the, in the EU itself. And uh, this is an area that if we really uh, uh, keep the momentum and are able to, our partners are able to go along with the, their own um, expectations and ambitions also practically in terms of the institutional setup and what the industry can deliver, this would go, in fact, beyond what is doable in uh, in a pre-accession pre context of being part of the internal market. Now, I don't think that we we, should, we can or should oversell this. We have to go step by step, and we have to go really uh, first uh, in sectors uh, where where there is uh, both mutual interest, but also. I think the digital area is a perfect example where things are developing very dynamically, uh, both in, uh, in our partner countries and in the EU, and that can be done together. We already mentioned, uh, I think the, the Ukrainian uh, colleague mentioned the ACAS, the Agreements of Conformity, sort of the, the industrial, industrial visa-free regime, if you will, uh, as it's sometimes referred to, which and puts a very tall order 
on, on our partner countries, but we are now going through a, 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 a process to see whether, whether that can be done. We have gone through the visa liberalization uh, process in, in all three. The trade is in fact uh, very much uh, increasing and we are the main trading partner of all uh, three of the countries. And I think this is uh, certainly an area where there already has been openness yeah. will continue to, to meet in the context of the, of the, of the trio with the, with the EU institutions. And last but not least, um, uh, we are... Are you uh, not, not ready? Yeah, can you, can you uh, uh, mute yourself? Okay, and uh, last but not least, there is a, a very sizable investment uh, program that uh, we are putting together for the countries. Uh, going forward, we are just starting the new, new uh, multi-annual financial framework, and I think that we will continue supporting a lot of the reforms and combine it with uh, very, very targeted investments for the for the economies to help with the, with the convergence uh, uh, aspect. Now, I would uh, just like to say the one area where I'm not uh, really sure I agree with the study is, is calling the uh, policies that we have uh, ad hoc. I mean, we may agree or we, one may agree or disagree with the, with the ambition, with the full scope, et cetera, of the policies, but I think that both the neighborhood policy and the Eastern Partnership aspect, as well as the Western Balkans one, is a is a is a fairly coherent uh, 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 policy uh, framework for for both. Uh, and and again, let me just remind that uh, we indeed need to need to uh, uh, implement it very much under close scrutiny of uh, of the member states. So it's a it is a very dynamic process from this uh, uh, this point of view. And uh, to just finish, I wanna say that uh, I think that some of the ideas on how to um, compare and maybe benchmark in a, in a light way the, the, the countries is, is, is a valid one. Well, let us look into it. I also agree with the notion that the countries are objectively very comparable. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about uh, uh, the need for stronger anchoring of the rule of law and, uh, and accountable judiciaries that are able to support both the economic activity as well as the uh, individual rights. And I think that this is very much a theme that is common to Eastern partnership countries to the TRIO and the Western Balkan countries. And this way we will find a number of areas where the, where the uh, countries are very, very similar and comparable. So indeed, uh, perhaps a little, infusing a little competition into uh, that would come from benchmarking is, uh, is not, <clears throat> yeah, and I will uh, stop at this. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Katerina. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate very much for your for your comments and for what you are doing. And really, uh, you know, we we hope that uh, those ideas which are presented in in, in the report uh, will inspire all of us, both in all the institutions, you know, in, in Parliament, in Commission, in and also in uh, external action service. So that's where we are now turning to uh, Mr. Richard Tibels, head of division Eastern Partnership Bilateral Relations from EIS. So. Richard, please, floor is yours. Good, good morning. Okay. I oh, seem yeah. to have a, yeah. I seem to have a connection problem precisely no, no. at the Katerina's intervention when you were looking to me to intervene. So I'm glad I've got the screen back now. Uh, I, I'm firstly thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Uh, Michael and the team at SEPS for uh, this uh, very, very timely uh, report. It does make us at the coal face, I think, think uh, beyond the today and the tomorrow to uh, what is possible in the future. I, I'm very conscious of the time. Let me try and make four uh, brief remarks. Uh, firstly, I think the very fact of the President of the European Council's visit to the three 
uh, associated countries over the past uh, week is not just of symbolic uh, importance, but also very tangible uh, uh, support for the three partner countries. Uh, and he's passed very, very clear messages in each of uh, the three uh, countries. Combined with that, um, uh, I agree with, with those of you who have said that the COVID crisis has also shown that despite the different institutional relationships between partner countries and the EU, we are one European continent and we need to address issues together. So I think the COVID crisis has also uh, broken down some uh, barriers there. My second point is that uh, I don't think we should underestimate the differentiation uh, that we can uh, apply within the existing uh, Eastern Partnership uh, Policy Framework. And as Katerina has said, as we now uh, prepare for the summit later this year, uh, I think we'll be examining how we can enhance uh, differentiation in, in ways which uh, respond to uh, the partners' uh, aspirations. I have to say, I don't think we should um, do this in uh, a way which uh, says there is one set of three countries and another set of three countries. Uh, I think we have to be careful that uh, we uh, look at this perhaps in a more functional and sectoral way. Where are the objective areas for the three associated countries to, to work together? Um, we don't want to send a message, for example, that the very strong uh, judicial reform efforts are in, in Armenia are not recognised by the EU as well. So I think it's important not to have a complete uh, separation between three and three. Third point, I think we also mustn't underestimate uh, that our association agreements and DCFDAs are dynamic uh, agreements. Um, so these are living uh, agreements which we can develop as uh, the partner countries develop and as the EU acquis uh, develops. So we have the process of updating the annexes uh, to the association agreements, and that's an ongoing process which really does ensure that um, uh, the objectives that we have together uh, are uh, run in parallel to the EU acquis. And we have a number of review processes, which have also been referred to already. Uh, uh, a number in Ukraine have already started. Uh, DG Trade is doing some uh, evaluations with regard to Georgia and Moldova at the moment. So all of these uh, instruments are a way of ensuring that we get the most out of uh, uh, our association agreements. It is quite right that uh, the think tank community looks beyond the current institutional setups and many of uh, the ideas that uh, uh, you've put forward in the study, I think, go beyond the existing institutional frameworks. Uh, obviously, our focus is on what is possible within the current uh, inst institutional frameworks. We know very well there is uh, no appetite for um, uh, any ratification processes uh, or relating to new agreements at the moment. So we're very much focused on getting the most out of our existing uh, uh, setups. Fourth point, um, um, in all of our uh, work, uh, I think it is quite clear that issues related to the rule of law are uh, essential in enabling us to move forward. Uh, the High Representative called judicial reform in relation to Ukraine the mother of all reforms. And I think that's the light motive that we use in our relations with all Eastern partners. And uh, although I don't deal with the Balkans, maybe it's, it's an area also where there is a similarity between the Eastern partnership and the countries of the Western uh, Balkans. The President of the European Council passed equally strong messages with regard to this during uh, his visit. So uh, my message, I think, there is to enable us to move forward. It is vital that uh, the partner countries on their side do uh, redouble their efforts to tackle rule of law, judicial reform, uh, uh, corruption and uh, oligarchic uh, economic uh, models. Thanks very much, Andreas. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. Now we are switching to a panel of members of our own parliament, and I am very happy to see that we have quite a group of them. Uh, in European Parliament, as you know, you know we, we can speak only not more than two minutes. 
<laughs> that's our our regulation and i will try to be very strict since at one o'clock we were promised that we shall be switched off so that's that's a problem uh, so uh, and i i am very happy to introduce the first speaker which is quite a uh, unique uh, mr sanchez uh, amor uh, Nacho, since unique, since is you know, one of the Mediterraneans who is really taking uh, a lot of you know interest in development of Eastern Partnership uh, region, and who is leading a uh, working group in in Euronest uh, responsible for uh, association countries. So, Nacho, please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Andreas. Thank you for your for your proposal. Thank you for the initiative. I think it's it's, it's very timely. Uh, I think I, I could understand this bureaucratic approach of, of, the, of the Commission and the European uh, External Service. Okay, we have this framework. What could we do in that framework? This is a, this is a normal thing coming from, from officials, but we are politicians. And we have to first analyze why the process is becoming to a kind of a sticky period. Uh, we are acting business unusual and there are a lot of things happening outside our scope, and we have to review not only our tools, our political will uh, to conduct or not uh, this uh, process. And I think we have to react. And to react is to put ideas on the table, like Andreas, Andreas did with these ideas and with the study. We could discuss on the scope, on the, on the feasibility, on the durability or not, but what we, do we really need in the parliament are these ideas. A, a, a couple of things. The first thing is the political will, because we understood that the, the societies in the association agreement countries and Western Balkan are engaged with the European values and the European perspective. Are the ruling elites the same? Uh, and I think we have to examine if the political will of the ruling elites is, is met at the political will of, of the societies. Second, I, I comment with uh, Andrea. Andrews, uh, the, to merge both areas, both geographical areas in one general scope uh, could create some reluctance in the Western Balkans because they are formally candidate countries and that cre creates uh, not the, 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 the support that these ideas needed is other thing to, to think about. And the, the third one and the last one, we have to change our way to approach the enlargement process because the geopolitical conditions change. Because now these societies, uh, geographically near Europe, uh, always have seen Europe as the model. But now there are other models in the, in the political market, in the geopolitical market. And these models are also attractive for them. Uh, uh, in 25 years ago, the only model was everybody wants to be a mature Western democracy. Now it, it, that it's changed completely, and there are other models, more illiberal models, more authoritarian threat model. And for that reason, we have to examine the things in a completely different way than we did in the early steps of this uh, enlargement process. These are my ideas. Thank you, Andrews, for your invitation. I'm always ready to, to engage in that kind of, of things. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nacho. Thanks a lot. And I forgot to, to, to mention that Nacho also is a social democrat. Now we are turning to, uh, I would like to ask Andrei Kovachev uh, from EPP, vice president of our group. And uh, Andrei is also uh, very much involved into uh, Western Balkans. So that's, uh, uh, he knows both sides, you know, both regions, and he's uh, also, uh, as I remember, standing rapporteur on some of South Caucasus countries. I even told on, you. Uh, yeah. on Armenia. Armenia. Exactly. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrius. And uh, thank you very much to all uh, panelists, especially to Mr. Michael uh, Emerson. I uh, wrote very, very uh, carefully your, um, your uh, contribution and the comparison between Eastern Partnership country and the Western Balkan countries, which are uh, after the Thessaloniki meeting, uh, so to say, officially like a promise that they will become uh, one day, one day, a full member of the European Union. And this uh, commitment from the part of the European uh, Union was uh, reconfirmed with the Sofia Declaration uh, a few years ago. Um, but uh, as uh, you can see, how difficult is uh, also 
uh, the, um, uh, the discussion within the European Union, our uh, ad absorption capacity in the European Union, uh, also on the, uh, if you like, on the on the public uh, opinion in many member states, uh, uh, although maybe. Uh, how to say, uh, politicians are saying one, but uh, actually meaning uh, something else, uh, that uh, full membership uh, is something which cannot happen so fast, uh, uh, maybe with exception of Montenegro, which is a small country with, with less uh, historical, uh, maybe uh, issues and problems uh, to be solved. Now the geopolitical influence from uh, Russia is a point not only in the Eastern partnership, but also in the Western Balkan, uh, especially if we talk about uh, Serbia and the uh, Serbian influence in some countries uh, of the of the region, um, and uh, if we see the macroeconomical uh, data, uh, some other data which uh, Mr. Emerson uh, compare uh, the both uh, regions, uh, you will see similarity, and and in some area even uh, Eastern Partnership country uh, a bit ahead than uh, uh, some countries from the Western Balkan. So, uh, in any case, there should be not a competition uh, and should be not something like uh, um, uh, replacement of, uh, for the Western Balkan for the perspective of uh, full membership. Uh, uh, but uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the public, uh, in, the, in Europe, we are talking now about, uh, when they, they are, their are voices talking about something like, uh, like it was before for Turkey, everything except institutions in the, in the, in the immediate, uh, uh, something like an intermediate uh, stage until the full membership. Uh, and uh, for Eastern partnership, the, um, the, the agreements which was signed with the European Union uh, for sure need to be filled with more, more enthusiasm, more uh, energy from European Union side uh, to give them more strength for continuing of the reforms uh, uh, for solving uh, uh, and uniting them uh, uh, also against uh, um, influence uh, which is coming from uh, Moscow. Um, on uh, if you go to Caucasus uh, and Armenia, Azerbaijan, this is a big issue which I don't even like to to open. I become a, uh, rapporteur only one week before starting of this uh, unfortunate actions, uh, uh, very bloody actions in, in, in the region. Uh, and uh, I don't know how this uh, will end up finally, but uh, we are observing with a big, big uh, concern uh, the situation there. But again, uh, Andrews, thank you very much uh, for uh, all your efforts. Again, to Mr. Mr. Emerson, uh, for uh, for the work uh, and uh, let's uh, keep on this uh, and continue our uh, good cooperation uh, of the in favor of the both uh, regions and their an integration as much as is possible uh, into the European Union uh, functional and institutional uh, framework. Well, thanks a lot, Andre. And now uh, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Voyola von Cramon uh, from Germany, Greens, you know, and. Uh, uh, she knows, as I understand, she knows all the regions. I know that she knows Eastern Partnership, you know, uh, almost, uh, you know, I see the best knowledge of, among uh, members of our parliament with Viola, you know, but I, as I know, she knows also very well Western Balkans. So Viola, please. Thank you very much, Andreas, for, for the flowers and also for the opportunity to speak here. While I know that two minutes might be a little bit too limited, but nevertheless, I really enjoyed the discussion before and I couldn't make it uh, completely to read this uh, study. But I know some of the authors and uh, they are very well known also in my house since Veronika Movchan, I think, has worked with my husband several times. And very much appreciated here so I will definitely look uh, through this a little bit more um, carefully later on but well no it was uh, very very let's say one-sided and everyone is absolutely on one side and let me maybe put a little bit more realpolitik in, in, in the whole story while I see that when I'm here back in Germany and when I'm in the west let's put it that way I'm uh, lobbying or the biggest lobbyist for Eastern Partnership and for the societies and for solidarity and for a clear rhetoric. But 
when I'm back in the uh, countries of the Eastern Partnership, I would say, well, there are so many things ahead of us. And really, I mean, uh, look through the homework we have to do together and, and be honest where we are. Uh, be it in the uh, state of the Western Balkan. I've just finished my report on Kosovo while I'm also a shadow on, on Serbia. And mm. I mean, there's a stat ca uh, state capturing going on a way which is really hard to tackle. And we are not even close to making uh, those countries uh, a, a serious offer. And I think this is also good that we can speak open about this. And we also should see what kind of developments we have in some of the member states within the European Union and why we have a high Euroscepticism in, in the um, members of the European Union in the population and uh, amongst our citizens. It's sometimes hard to explain that we would strive, and I do this, uh, for enlargement. Um, and, and so I think we have to put uh, things a little bit um, together and also make clear that um, if we go on with supporting uh, the Western partner, uh, the, the states and the Western Balkan, which we do, the Eastern partnership, which I'm heavily in favor of, then we need results and we have to have cl clear criteria and we would like to have a performance which matches uh, with uh, the investment we have done and this sometimes falls apart to be honest so i see for example now in, in georgia i'm a big friend and a leading member leading yeah member of the deck uh, I would be um, heavily in favor to go there to, to start some kind of mediation. The political crisis is, is, is really tragic. But what they have done out of the association agreement is also a tragic uh, situation. They have done almost nothing in the last years and months. And so, I mean, really start with your homework first, and then we can speak about uh, further steps towards, uh, I mean, Trio plus or whatsoever. Um, Moldova, um, there's, there's still a heritage of this uh, state capturing system of, of uh, the, the oligarch. Um, and and all, everyone knows that. And it's, of course, up to us to help and to support. But nevertheless, it is also up to us to see some substantial um, uh, success and some substantial progress before we enter the next uh, stage. So yes, we will support you and we will put hopefully more money than in the past. Uh, we have not even spoken about countries such as Belarus and uh, now um, Nagorny Karabakh and, and, and the regions where, and also the east of, of Ukraine where a lot of money will be needed. But recently I was in a very interesting call with uh, former ambassador Michael McFall and he made a point which I think is crucial for all of us to think about. The best help to overcome uh, the Putin's regime is functioning democracies in all the Eastern partnership countries. And he reminded the Ukrainians first to start with a functioning rule of law system, with a functioning democracy. And still, I mean, we can speak about all the um, economical um, uh, similarities and opportunities. As I said, I'm in favor, but nevertheless, uh, from the political side, from the homework side, I see that this is still balanced. Uh, the EU has to deliver, and we have not really done this when it comes to visa liberalization in Kosovo. That's a disaster after three years of promising and not delivering. But on the other hand, I'm also very strict when it comes to our partner states and our partners in the states uh, to speak up uh, very, very frankly and openly what needs to be done. Thanks a lot, Loyola. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate very much. Now I would like to ask Zifrid, Zifrid Murasan uh, from EPP, from Romania, uh, you know, and uh, also head of uh, Moldova delegation and also, you know, being next to Balkans and being next to Moldova. So Zifrid, please, floor is Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So uh, the important question is, you know, why are we not farther? ahead when it comes to supporting the Eastern Partnership, when it comes to getting the Eastern Partnership countries closer to the European Union. And the truth is, because of the reality in the, in the countries on the ground, because of the fact that there still are some reforms to be done, and secondly, because of the perception which exists about those countries within the um, within uh, some of the member states of the Union, and the answer is we have to work on both issues. Firstly, we have to help the countries to reform. 
they have to do that as well. We have to be ready and we have the tools, that's clear. Secondly, we have to talk more about the good things that the European Union is doing in those countries because it, um, it all links one with another. The more people understand that we do, the more pro-European they become and the more support the pro-European politicians will have and that will be good news for the European Union. We do a lot, but we also have to talk about the good things that we are doing in those countries. Moldova, the country that I know best in the Eastern neighborhood, it has increased its trade with the European Union, with Romania, which is my home country and the neighboring country of Moldova, a lot in the past years since the association agreement exists. So it's a very, very good thing. Um, and we have, to, we have to present these concrete achievements and also our concrete implications there to the people of, of those countries. The countries have to reform. That's obviously easier said than done. But the pandemic now has convinced us again that, you know, if you are unreformed, and we see it in some of our countries, you know, if the education system is not digitalized enough, if the health system is not modern enough, uh, not enough capacity is not digitalized enough, uh, this becomes more obvious when you are hit by a crisis. So it's clear that, you know, the reform agenda has to continue in a, uh, in a decisive way. Then we have to improve the perception about the Eastern Partnership countries also within the member states of the Union, because let's be honest, decision makers at European level are not ready to embrace the Eastern Partnership countries also because of the, of the perception that exists in those countries. We all remember the referendum in the Netherlands with regards to Ukraine. Um, and in order to make these countries more popular, we have to talk to the people on the, uh, on the ground in, you know, particularly Western European countries, so that you know what the decision makers, what the politicians here in their constituencies is more positive about these countries. We have to make clear at European level that helping Eastern partnership countries means helping ourselves. And we can only be safe. And Viola said it so well, you know, I mean, um, uh, the biggest gain that we can have, you know, in relation with Putin is, you know, to have safe, stable, uh, functional democracies in the Eastern uh, partnership countries. And I say we can only be safe and stable within the borders of the 27 if we are surrounded by safe and stable neighbors. So we have to make clear within the 27 to the wider uh, population that uh, it's in our own interest. It's in the interest of the 27 member states to help the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, countries as well. Obviously, the more progress each of them makes, you know, the better for them, but the cooperation within the countries. And I agree with everything that was said also by Katarina in uh, the sense that um, there are more, uh, the Western Balkans are more homogeneous. Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, but, you know, uh, we have to, uh, uh, we have to see as well where there are opportunities within the Eastern uh, Partnership countries. There is less homogeneity there, but clearly we have to encourage young people to travel uh, from one country to another, SMEs, the private sector, the economy, the more they will do cross-border, you know, uh, the, uh, the better. And also close um, ties with the Central and Eastern European countries, which um, recently joined the European Union. Yes, closer cooperation between Eastern Partnership countries and Western Balkans might be desirable as well, but the reform expertise is much stronger in the Baltic countries, in Poland, um, in Romania and Bulgaria as well in many areas. And uh, the Eastern Partnership countries need to do what the Central uh, and Eastern European current EU member states have done, um, have done, uh, have done recently as well. So uh, the more we can, you know, generate engagement from these EU member states in the Eastern Partnership also in a bilateral way, the better. Um, I was encouraged by the fact that, you know, last week the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, our former colleagues from the European Parliament, um, Gabrielus Landsbergis was in the Republic of Moldova and amongst other things announced a donation of vaccines for the people of the Republic of Moldova. The people of the Republic of Moldova will not forget this, you know, because they will remember exactly who helped them during a pandemic. So such uh, 
small gestures like that donation of vaccines bilaterally done by Lithuania to the Republic of Moldova, my home country Romania also donated vaccines, uh, that will not be uh, forgotten uh, too, uh, too quickly. That's it from my side. I think there is reason for optimism and I think if we act on all of these panels, um, much can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Zygrid. And the last uh, member for the Parliament who will speak, uh, Mrs. Strasayuk Nyavishin from EPP. Thank you. Uh, I will be as short as possible. Uh, now that uh, everybody has lack of time, very important research and presentations. Uh, my just few geopolitical thoughts. Uh, these presentations are important for both, by the way, uh, EU and NATO, because two of uh, three of countries are applicants for NATO membership as well. And now we have to find main answer why three of countries are still far from the possible invitee status uh, to start negotiations. And I have, uh, I will put on the table two aspects. The first one, lack of understanding in EU that EU needs countries into the East. And because of that, we also have uh, uh, such situation. And my uh, Spanish colleague answered it very clear that really we need those countries because there are because we we have they they will uh, uh, get some alternatives, and they are not uh, EU interest to uh, to to go to go for those countries there. And my evaluation and second one uh, is Kremlin factor. I will be very frank and open. Of course third countries are able to uh, influence the uh, situation on, on enlargement. And uh, my last point is that uh, we have to overcome those two, uh, two, two questions, how to say issues. Uh, first of all, stop uh, be afraid of Kremlin. And uh, that is, uh, I, I think, uh, this feeling is, is, is not, the, not the best way to help those countries because uh, Putin is uh, opportunist. He is doing uh, as much as we allow to do him. And if we are not able to do steps forward, he will do his steps forward. Look what happened in 2008 when in uh, Bucharest, in NATO summit, um, somebody, some countries blocked uh, possible um, membership action plan for, for Georgia and Ukraine to NATO. Uh, Georgia, Georgia got a war. Uh, Russia um, made a war against, against Georgia. So it means it's a very clear example of opportunism and of situation when we, when we have lack of security uh, in one or another region. Putin is using such situations. So don't be afraid, Putin. Rasa, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, how we are coming to the uh, no, final stage of our uh, discussion. Jonas, who is hosting us, you know, he gave us three minutes, uh, additional ones. And that is the whole time which we have with Michael and, and Stephen uh, uh, Bloxman from SEPS, you know, to conclude our, our discussion of today, which means that we have very limited time. And that uh, perhaps is also why we shall continue in other, you know, uh, seminars and other, another discussion, discussion, this very important topic. So I don't know who will start. Stephen, maybe you will uh, make some, some remarks. Stephen, I've got something to say, but why don't you shoot? I will yeah, be happy to. I'll be happy to, to thank you all for, uh, for the opportunity first, uh, Andreas, to uh, and SEPS, you know, to provide this, uh, this study, um, which has been, you know, uh, difficult in the making and uh, trying to compare, you know, apples and pears in many cases, we've, we've done as best as, uh, as we could. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we're open to, to constructive uh, criticism still uh, to improve um, the methodology here. Uh, second, comparing the two groups of countries, um, is indeed perhaps a cheeky way of, um, of instilling a bit of uh, competition uh, in it and especially uh, to spur more reforms in the Western Balkans. The, the overall um, conclusion, however, uh, and, and starting point, in fact, for the, for the report is that both policy areas are a bit in the doldrums and could benefit from new momentum. And this is what we hope to achieve, of course, with this, with this report. 
the, the observations that have been made that um, fundamentals ought to be addressed first and rule of law in particular, uh, risk, however, creating a sort of catch-22 situation in which some of the Western Balkans uh, find themselves at the moment. Um, their uh, reforms, especially in Albania, have been very radical in this uh, respect, but have been perhaps not as best designed as they should and um, lead to um, new delays, basically also in, um, in disbursement of, uh, of funding. So when tackling these fundamentals, um, both the member states, which are not addressed in this uh, particular setting and which should definitely um, be, uh, be approached in, in subsequent stages of dissemination of this report, uh, together with the EU institutions and, uh, of course, the, uh, the neighboring countries, uh, they ought to, I think, revisit the design and implementation of these fundamentals as, as one of the key building blocks uh, so as to reform the, uh, both the enlargement process um, and, uh, and the Eastern Partnership. Um, that would be a good place to start. So with that, uh, from my side, perhaps, Michael, a few final words? Michael, please, go on. Uh, thank you. Um, um, well, final points. One, since we finished the drafting of the paper, and it's been in circulation for a few days, uh, we've had responses from uh, people in the Balkans, think tankers in the Balkans. And I've become aware, which I hadn't been when we were finishing the paper, that there are a number of papers in circulation from Balkan think tanks that are very much along the same lines of progressive uh, integration. And so that is something to be followed up. Let's leave my second point. I mean, this, this whole business is Balkans and uh, East Europeans together, but this particular session, of course, is very much an East European session. Um, and uh, we, we, for our part, will be thinking about how to <coughs> um, get the uh, Balkans into uh, into this debate, which we can certainly do ourselves with respect to the think tanks. This leads to the specific point as to merger or not, <laughs> the, the term was used, not by us, but uh, the hypothesis was there. I would say from all that we've been discussing today, we're not discussing a merger, but we are discussing certainly the possibility for a common and unified system of monitoring between the two groups, which our paper, I think, illustrates, which is absolutely relevant to the interesting point about interregional competition that has been uh, raised. Uh, and then a final point is the um, question of linkage to the conference on the future of Europe. We're about to begin with one um, uh, chat contributor having suggested, uh, raised the question. Well, there I would say, yes, uh, there should be uh, some organizational arrangement whereby all neighboring states in Balkans and Eastern Europe that aspire to membership, they have uh, a legitimate uh, claim to a voice in the process for other states of the Eastern Partnership, for example, that do not aspire to membership, they put themselves in this context into, into a different uh, category. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks a lot, Stephen. And uh, well, my concluding just a few, few sentences, you know, thanks a lot to all the participants and especially to SEP, you know, for <clears throat> producing this report and also for really opening the doors for, I think, new, some kind of, you know, intellectual and geopolitical uh, thinking about, about, you know, how to proceed further, looking not only into, you know, what is happening now or what will happen during, you know, this year, but what can happen during the whole decade. And having in mind how geopolitically things are, are changing with Belarus, with Russia even, how big influence can be made by success of Eastern Partnership countries, you know, for the whole development, that is that is what we, you know, what we need to have in mind. And uh, I think that especially for Eastern Partnership, for three of countries, uh, this much more clear picture of what is possible to achieve should become really a, this, you know, what I call always very, 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 very attractive carrot. Not a theoretical discussion about you know membership perspective, which never was leading to any kind of you know clear conclusion 
and sometimes making frustration, which for me, it was looking like really very dangerous development that you can start to lose your know, motivation for reforms if, if really you do not see clear paths how, how, how to move forward. So that is what I see really is opening, opening some kind of new, new possibilities. And that is what, what really is creating this new momentum. Uh, so I think that we shall discuss really in different uh, fora, you know, uh, those major ideas. And again, we shall meet again and, and again. And thanks uh, again to everybody and especially to Jonas, who is you know, uh, hosting our, our conversation and who is becoming nervous because he will need to, uh, st to start a new one, you know, very soon conversation. So thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks and see, see you later. Jonas. Thanks. Bye. Jonas Skube, if you get back.